diving into engine performance 2 test 8. We're going to be talking a little bit about ignition systems in here and whatnot. So let's say with the first question here is the primary, which is the low voltage ignition system, must be working correctly before any spark occurs from the coil. Which component is not in the primary ignition circuit? Ignition module, pickup coil, ignition switch, or spark plug wires? Spark plug wires are secondary. Where the high spark's popping, where the load's being carried, where things are being done, that's actually going to be, you know, where the work's being done is going to be your uh, secondary. The ignition module has direct control over the firing of all the coils in an EI system. Which component contributes, I mean, controls the module, actually triggers the module? That's all of the above. Pickup coil, crankshaft sensor, computer. I had a situation one day, and I'm going to tell this story very briefly because it's really an important story regarding ignition systems. I had a Ranger, right? And uh, you see that uh, reach up there on top of that. See that board that's sitting up there kind of crooked? Uh, that's, reach up there and grab that. Now the other one, right above your head, Lindy. Very top. Right, that, that one right there. See if you can jump up there and grab that. All right, now flip that around. You see that module right there? It's got a spider web on it. That module right there is an EDIS module. And when they first came out with that, they came out with a distributorless ignition module, which actually fired up the... Uh, yeah, don't put it on a shelf. Put it somewhere. Put it on the floor or something. There. But anyway, you know, the um, that EDIS module takes a crank signal uh, signal from the sensor through a pair of twisted wires that are shielded, and it's basically what operates the uh, coil packs. Now, that particular module was located on. They started. They came out in '95 with this particular module on these trucks. You see, I basically had this on a board earlier. It was one that was partially faulty, and it's an e this has come off of an Explorer that had this, but they went away from this after only a year or so, and they did away with this EDIS module, and they put the, they put the firing of the coils in the PCM. You know, why do you need this when you can just do it with the PCM? This is a piece of hardware you didn't have to buy. PCM didn't cost any more when they moved this function in there, so they saved money by doing away with this e $110 EDIF module. All right. Anyway, on this Ranger I'm talking about, um, I was didn't have any spark whatsoever. I had one of those EDIS modules in my toolbox that I used for testing. I mean, it was a new one, you know, that I had. And so I took and plugged it in, and I still didn't have any power. I had power, I had ground, I had everything I needed. Now listen to this, because this is important. Y'all don't miss this. Anytime you've got an electronic box that's got a job to do, it has to have power, it has to have ground, and it has to have the proper, you know, the circuitry's all got to be there. In other words, you can't have any broke wires or loose connectors or nothing like that. But you got to have power, you got to have ground, you got to have the necessary signals, and you have to be able to put output to whatever it's going to be doing. This one had everything it needed. And I even put an oscilloscope, and you got to figure out whatever you got to do to check it on that uh, cruise control that uh, Kelly worked on the other day. Basically, what we did was we wanted to make sure that all the buttons were coming in. Yeah, we had the little feed coming from the uh, brake pressure switch. It's supposed to be hot all the time unless you mash the brake and it goes away. We had a ground coming through the stoplight bulbs. Uh, we had everything we needed on that module. The only thing that we didn't really have a good way to check without rolling the scope over there was the speed sensor signal, right? We hooked that up and we, you know, jacked the car up and the speed sensor signal was there. And so we said, okay, we said, this module has everything it needs and it's not doing its job, so it has to be a bad module. You understand that? You got your inputs, you got your outputs, all of the circuits are good, the module's bad. That's how you condemn a module in most cases. Now, sometimes the shop manual will even say, substitute a known good part. Well, if you ain't got a known good part, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? Well, I had a known good part, plugged it into this Ranger. It didn't start. I mean, it just went, no, 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 no spark. I hooked the scope up to the crank sensor wires, and when I hooked the scope up to the crank sensor wires, I got a nice predictable one of these. All right. Well, in the meanwhile, the shop foreman walks up, and he said, this guy just parked his motor home three weeks ago, and now it won't start. And I says, well, he's probably got ants in a relay. And so we went over there, and I, we checked it out, and I switched the key on. I didn't hear a fuel pump, and I went to the fuel pump relay. 
and I pulled it out and popped the cover off of it. It was clicking, but it wouldn't run the fuel pump. Pulled it out, and there was one ant that had got in that relay and got between the points. And whenever it went to close, it crushed that ant, but there was no current flow into the fuel pump. Inside so I, the relay. Yeah, inside the relay. It's got a little hole in the bottom of some of these relays, and I probably got one I can show you down there. Some of the Ford relays would have a little hole by one of the terminals, and those ants would climb into that hole, and they'd get up in there, a little square hole. I don't know why that hole was there, but not all relays have it. So I said, well, let's put a different relay in there. So we did, boom. And then, you know, six minutes, I had this motorhome going again. A little teeny tiny ant stops a 10,000 pound motorhome from pulling out of its tracks, you know. So anyway, I pat myself on the back, and now i got to go back and look at this ranger that's been kicking my fanny all morning, you know. What am I going to do with this stupid thing? And so just because I said everything is there, I know the module is good. I know there's nothing wrong with the coil pack. I mean, because all the, you know, the pulsing is not even going to the coil pack. If the coil pack's not getting a pulsing signal, it's not going to start. It's not going to fire. So basically, I want to know, am I getting a pulse to the coil pack? If I'm getting a pulse to the coil pack, but it's not firing, now the coil pack's bad. That's not, compl that's not complicated, is it? Got to think the right way. This is taking a little bit, but bear with me, okay? All right, so I said, I wonder if I could run some an overlay from the crank sensor to the PCM. I wonder what that would do. But, you know, the wires need to be twisted around one another. So I got two wires, and I put both wires in a, a vise on one end, and I grabbed the end of the other two wires with the other on my drill, and I spun the drill, and I made a nice little twisted pair. And then I wrapped some foil tape around them and all that stuff that I could ground, and I hooked it up. I cut the crank sensor wires at both ends. Now, listen, this is important, too. you got to make sure you hook the gray one to the gray one and the black one to the black one. If you switch them around, it won't start. You can't hook the crank sensor up backward and have it start up. It will not work. Is it's it got to be looking at the, sensor? huh? Is it just a magnetic sensor? Yeah, it is. But for some strange reason, the, it, the signal's upside down. I've done that on our Ranger. I've hooked the crank sensor up backwards, and you look at the scan tool, you'll start seeing a speed signal, and it'll drop to zero, and you'll never get a single spark, even though everything's right, wow. except the transverse, tra you know, wires transpose. <laughs> Somebody does that at the PCM, and you're not looking at a wire schematic close, you're going to miss that. You got me? That's why you're in school. I mean, this is important stuff I'm telling you. Okay, so I actually ran an overlay, and the transposed wires wasn't an issue here, but it could be if somebody had a, you know, accidentally pulled them out and put them back in the other way. Now my car won't start. They don't tell you nothing. They just bring it to you. And at the sensor, unless you've got another one to compare it to, you're not going to be able to look at that and tell. Uh-uh. You know? But anyway, I spun it up. I ran an overlay on the wire from the PCM, I mean from, the, I'm sorry, the EDIS module, which is this thing right here, to the crank sensor, and it fired up. <laughs> All right, so I looked at the signal after, I looked at the signal after it fired up, and I noticed that spinning it over with my overlay, this signal was a little bit taller, but not much. <laughs> Now, okay, what was funny about that was about um, four days later, this guy up the line says, I've got a ranger over here that's got everything it needs, but it won't fire the calls. But it's got, I said, what, what, has it got EDIS? He goes, no, it's got a piece, the PCM fires the calls. I said, well, run an overlay from the crank sensor to the PCM, cutting out your old wires, and just see what that does. <laughs> and a little bit later, I heard it go, Whoa. I only saw that twice in my whole career, but I saw it was like in a space of four days. But see, I mean... And it's bad wires? I, yeah, and I will tell you something about wires. Wires are really crazy. I had a uh, worked on a, a 94 Thunderbird one time, and it had EDIS, the same system on it. That was in the mid-90s when that EDIS was there. It was on some of them. And it, went, it went away like in 06, I mean in 96, rather not 06. All right, so I'm sitting here... This FBI guy that had been an FBI guy now is a bail bondman. He comes in here and he says, my car just won't start and I don't know why. So I pull it in here. I hook up the service bay diagnostic system and it's telling me that I've got an open circuit between the EDIS module and the PCM. Okay, now the EDIS module was right out here and the PCM is inside the car and there's a wire go in one wire basically and it's in some other wires that are shielded here's the shock tower you know with your strut in there and this wire was leaving the, the thing and it was going here and it was going through a little hard plastic loom over there going through the firewall into the car 
for the PCM. And so what I did was I undid this loom, uh, uh, unrolled the tape off of it, and I, I, well, I, I got to one place right here over the shock tower where I could wiggle that, and my open circuit would come and go. And that's the circuit that was keeping it from starting. Yeah, pop perhaps. But I actually went into the PCM and I unlatched that terminal and pulled it out of the PCM. I haven't cut any wire. And I unwrapped all of this stuff and I unlatched the terminal and pulled it out of here. This is one of those situations where you're the last line of defense. You don't really have anybody you can ask. You know what I'm saying? If you ask the hotline guy, he's able to tell you to do all kinds of expensive, time-consuming stuff that you won't get paid for. So I said, okay, I'm going to pull this out of here. And I got this piece of wire in my hands, and it's about probably three feet, three or four feet long, whatever, orange wire. And I got my meter hooked to both ends of it, and I bent that wire every kind of way I could look. So I didn't see anything wrong with it. Bent it everywhere I looked, I could not make that thing lose connection no matter what I did anymore. And I got another wire that was close to that same color, and I put terminals on the end of it and soldered them and all that kind of stuff. Fed it back through the loom, wrapped it in this little shield, click, click, boom. You never had a problem again. I don't know what's going on with that wire. But that's not the only time I've seen wires do that where they look just fine. There's no, they've never been disturbed. They've just a bad wire. And I've actually seen them work when I would go, it's supposed to have five volts all the way from here to here. I would check it here and I'd have two volts. And I said, this is supposed to be five volts. So I'd go to the source of it coming from, and it'd be five volts. And as I followed my, the wire up here, checking it from here to here, it would go two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half, five. It's like suddenly it had turned into a resistor wire, even though there was nothing wrong with it. I've also seen situations where I would unplug a relay, look at the terminals, plug it back in, and it would fire up and never give the trouble again. <laughs> that irritates the ever-loving crap out of me because I don't know what it was. There was another time I was at a Chevrolet place over there, and this guy had this little uh, Chevrolet car in there. It was like a 99 model something or another, you know, had a little quad four engine in it. And uh, he was their go-to guy at the Chevrolet place, and I was over there talking to him. And I said, uh, and he had a no-start. But no, 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 no. He says, okay. So he actually is checking to see if his injectors are pulsing, and they're not. You know, he's basically listening to them. They're not pulsing. And so he goes to the, with a scan tool, and he's looking to see if they're, they ain't going to fire either. And he's checking his scan tool, and I was watching him, and uh, he's got a crank signal, you know, but he's got no injector activation, and he's got no uh, spark. And he says, well, I'm going to replace this ignition module under these coils. And I said, why? And he said, well, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that's what it must be. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your scan tool is reading a, a crank sensor. So that means your PCM is seeing the crank sensor. Why are you replacing the ignition module? I said, don't you think you need to look a little deeper? Well, he dug a little deeper, and he found out that the injector had no power going to him. And I think on that one, the ignition coil was fed by that same wire. You know, so was, he had a bad relay. <laughs> it was the only thing that was wrong. One little relay. And when he took the coil and he measured it with his meter, there was nothing there, and he could touch it with his thumb, and it would come, and then he would touch it with some again and go away. And so he had a bad relay. You see what I mean? But the long and short of it was he was about to exchange a real expensive part when all he needed was a relay. But he, he basically got to the end of his thinking and he was just going to pull apart at it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Let's, just, let's, let's look a little deeper, you know. You see that a lot at the park store down there, don't you? Yes. All right, then. So, now that was sort of a long, drawn-out, 10-minute uh, story, but I'm going to keep you guys going here. Uh, distributor ignition systems can be triggered by what? Either A or B. Number three, that's a, either A or B, a Hall effect sensor or a magnetic sensor. What about a spark sensor? What is that? Hang on, such thing. A compression sensing ignition system uses. Who knows? We talked. We've had. We did some of these before, right? Is that one spark? Hmm. Or is that just all of them? What do you think? Number four. I'm going to go with waste spark. Waste spark's good to me. Coil polarity is determined by which. The direction of the coil winding. Yeah. Now, some of these are similar to what we did, I think, in emissions, are they? Uh, how does a waste spark ignition system fire the spark plugs? Out of this, does the polarity reverse at each firing? The same plug always fired with straight or reverse polarity. The waste spark is sent to the cylinder next to the cylinder being fired, or both A and C. No, actually, 
the spark plug is always fired with either straight or reverse polarity. It's not going to change from firing to firing. But basically, the spark is actually traveling all the way through both plugs. That being said, you can still disconnect one plug and the other plug will still fire. It doesn't seem like it would, but it will. And I've, we have, I've seen people, you know, take exception with that even at factory schools. They would talk about, well, what we were told was if you unplug one of the companion plugs, the other one won't fire because it doesn't have a complete circuit. But it will. I'm telling you what, when that spark is being generated, it is going to find somewhere to go, basically. Uh, the pulse generator signals the computer that fires the spark plug directly, signals the electronic control module, fires the spark plug directly, is used as a tachometer reference signal by the computer and has no other function. That's B, actually. Signals the electronic control unit. What else is that pulse generator signal used for? Rich. Hey. Oh, um, I was just wanting to know if there's anything y'all could do to keep my wiring from coming out my horn. Well, you get a piece of tie wrap and pull it up in there. You know, a tie, I mean, a wire tie would do it. Yeah, we can make that up. Because it just keeps popping back out. Yeah. Out of the switch, you mean? Out of the little, where the straight wire hooks into that little box. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll be able to do something with that. Yeah. Just leave it out there and we'll see what we can do with it. Right. Leave the key in it. Okay. All right. I don't know how Joe hooked that up, but it probably needs to be directly either soldered to that wire or something. Um, but anyway, uh, let me see. Two technicians are discussing a distributor ignition system. Technician A says the pickup coil or optical sensor in the distributor is used to pulse the ignition module. Technician B says some distributor ignition systems use an optical sensor. What the heck is an optical sensor? <laughs> That's like your uh, old mice with a wall. <laughs> it's a it's a C, okay. An optical sensor, and I've got a distributor somewhere over here. Daniel, look over there and see if you can find that distributor. It's got that optical sensor in it. There should be a distributor laying in the bottom of that red pan over there, red uh, roll around. There is one peculiar looking little distributor there. They're supposed to be. Anyway. If there's a distributor over there. I can show you one of those. No, that ain't the one I'm looking for. It may be either not in there or, or so I may have sent you on a wild goose chase. If you don't find a distributor laying on the bottom of that, it's probably not in there. Anyway, you see this thing right here? Now watch. You see this? Watch this. See this? When I shine a light in there, that battery's dead. When I shine a light in there, if the thing's got a good battery in it, that light right there, that little detector will turn this light on. And uh, that's the first time I've ever seen that battery die. But anyway, they, you, if you put a little, put a little uh, plate in there with slits in it, every time one of those slits lets that light go through, it's going to have a square wave. And uh, I'm going to have to, here, take the back off that. I'm going to put a battery in it. That's the demo thing I do. Mice were. They had a little wheel on the inside, mm -hmm. and it was a slide wheel. And every time that light broke, mm, exactly what I'm talking it, about. It would move up and down or left yep. and right. The one I'm talking about, it's got little slits in it that are so fine that they have to have been cut with a laser. I mean, that's pretty amazing that that thing can see through there. But anyway, uh, uh, so that number eight is actually going to be C. So uh, both of them are right. Waste spark type ignition system fires what? I say all of them. Uh, yeah, all of the above. It's going to be uh, two, two at the same time. Motorcycles did that for years. You know what I mean? Yep. And uh, number ten. If you're a motorcycle guy, you have no trouble at all understanding waste spark ignition. The technician A says a two-wire coil on plug system uses a PCM to trigger the coil. Technician B says a three-wire coil on plug system has an ignition control module built into the coil assembly. Who's right about that? C. That's basically C. The, the, the little uh, potted coil on plug coils like we use on these Ford vehicles is basically, you know, it's got some electronics in there, but it's just basically fired directly by the um, PCM or whatever. But that um, the other ones, some of them, like the ones on that uh, GMC out there, they actually have a little circuit inside of them that whenever it's triggered, it fires a coil. Um, the Jeep Cherokees had actually a module... That the that the coil pack or the coil was mounted on, and it it would get a positive pulse from the PCM, and that module actually was carrying the load and firing the coil. The PCM was just triggering it, and you know that's the way that typically works on 
some of them. The ignition system is usually split into how many different sections? Three. Uh, well, typically only two, primary and secondary. Um, let me also say this real quick. Sometimes you may get a car, uh, one of these Lincolns or Fords or something, that's got all kinds of crazy stuff going on that you just doesn't make any sense at all on the dash, like you know, different things going wrong, you know, crazy radio don't work and this, that, and the other, and instrument cluster problems and, you know, weird running stuff. Occasionally, you'll have one bad ignition coil on a coil on plug that will cause all of those problems. So if you've got multiple crazy problems happening on one that's got coil on plug ignition, what you need to do is disconnect the coil one at a time, Unhook call number one, see if the problem goes away. Plug it back in, unhook call number two, see if the problem goes away. And unless you got two of them, you'll find it that way. You got me? Sometimes one call can make a whole engine do crazy things. You know, like whenever you're gassing it up, it, you know, bounce around and all that. And so what I'm going to try to do here is uh, I'm going to unplug the coil packs one at a time and see what I see. Yeah, particularly if you've got an engine skip and all this stuff is going on. I mean, like on the dash, I'm talking about inside the car, crazy things happening. Because it's basically sending electric interference out there. So just keep that in mind. It may you know, make you uh, somebody's hero one day. Which statement is correct? Most ignition systems work by switching the circuit, grounding the ignition coil secondary windings. Is that true? Most ignition systems work by switching the circuit, grounding power to the ignition coil secondary winding. Is that true? Most ignition systems work by switching the, the ground of the primary windings. The one exception to that that I know of off the top of my head is how many of you guys have done this hot rod stuff and you know, this multiple spark discharge system you put on hot rod race cars and all that? You know what I'm talking about? MSD ignition? That switches the positive side on the ones I've seen. You know what I mean? Instead of switching the negative side. Now, one of the reasons we switch the negative side as, many, as much as we do is because the negative side does not make as much, uh, you know, whenever you break a set of points, the spark tries to keep flowing across there, and it makes a little lightning bolt. Now, the capacitor, which is the condenser in a distributor, absorbs that and keeps that from happening, you see, so your points don't burn up. Obviously, if you've got a little set of points or anything, and every time you break that, uh, and it's going to try to keep flowing across that gap, and it's going to make a little bzz. It's like a little welding machine. It's going to burn things up. So you put a capacitor in there, you're still able to do the job, but you're not having all that hard wash going on. So basically, the ground the ground side of a circuit is less prone to making those you know lightning bolts whenever you break the connection than the positive side is. Positive side makes more. Um, that's why most of the PCM switched stuff is ground switched. Because it's easier on the drivers. Which of the following terms specified by the Society of Automotive Engineers is a term describing the ignition system that does not use a distributor? Anybody know? That's EI. That's part of that J1930 regulation. Uh, ignition system pickup coil may trigger, uh, or excuse me, or trigger is usually connected to what? Ignition module. That's the ignition module. Uh, what is the term used to create high voltage using low voltage? Anybody know that? Induction. Electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic. And what does that mean exactly? What do we have? We can. Huh? Synergistic integration. That's like that guy on that TV commercial. Center here or there. He's thinking outside the box. Okay. Electromagnetic induction. We talked about how you sweep across copper windings with a magnetic field. You're making juice. The more windings you have, the more juice you make. You got a lot of windings, you sweep across there, you're going to make a heavy duty spark. That is timing light. Took the timing light apart because it wasn't working like it was supposed to. And it had a little exciter coil in there that was kind of like ignition coil. And it was hooked up on the board. And I was fooling with this thing. And one of my buddies over there, he come over and was horsing around with it. You know, it flashes that little xenon bulb that gives you your timing flash. And little did he know, that thing's about like an ignition coil. And when he pulled the trigger on it, he was a little close, close to that thing. And it was like the phone company. It reached out and touched him. It fired him up big time. <laughs> but you never expect a little thing like that to make that kind of spark, but it did. Um, let me see. A technician A says the primary and secondary ignition systems are never connected. Is that true? Hello? Uh, 
Yeah. It's not true on oil filled coils and on the ones that are like this got a regular coil that's feeding the middle of the river cap. They are connected on those. They're not connected on coil pack ignition. On coil pack ignition, there's a core between them, but the windings are not connected anywhere. On a, uh, the one like that little round coil on that board over there, it's connected on one end, but on the other end it's not. But both of them, yeah. Basically, let me, let me get back to where I'm headed here. Let's see what the other one said. Uh, technician B says the primary and secondary windings are connected in some ignition coils. Yeah, 16 is B. Technician A says the primary coil has more windings. Technician B says the secondary coil has more windings. Who's right about that? The secondary. The secondary has got more windings. It's got way more. A lot more, like thousands and thousands and thousands more. Uh, okay, which statement below is correct? A, no voltage is induced in the secondary circuit. B, turning off the low voltage primary coil induces a high voltage in the secondary windings. C, no voltage is induced in the primary circuit. Or D, turning on the low voltage primary coil induces high voltage in secondary windings. B, isn't it? That's actually B. And uh, I, I talked about this before. I may have been an engine performance one, but um. One of the things that you need to be aware of is on these uh, ignition systems, when you're putting spark plug wires on, and you've got two wires that are next to each other on the distributor cap, and those two wires are also next to each other on the engine block, and you want to be a good, good mechanic, you know how you route them wires real pretty like, like I was having you all do? You want to run them right next to one another. Right? And we're talking about distributor ignition. Camaro, like 350 Chevrolet had this problem, and so did the Dagon 302 Ford. And uh, if you run the two wires like on the Ford, right here, like you're going to go, it's going to turn this way. It's going to go one, five, four, two, six, three, seven, eight. All right. On your engine, where's number one? One. Two, three, four, five, we're going to go five, six, seven, okay, seven and eight are right next to each other in the fire order on that one because the distributor turns this way, right? Okay, so I'm going to what if I run these wires right here, and I want that wire right there. What happens there is number seven fires right before number eight. It induces a spark in number eight, believe it or not. And while the number eight piston is still coming up, seven and eight are firing at the same time. And that makes eight fire too soon. And that causes an explosion in that cylinder before the piston is anywhere near top dead center. And you've got one cylinder that's labor knocking really, really bad. And when you pull a plug out, it looks like somebody has shot it with a heat-seeking round. I mean, this is terrible. And so what do you do about that? Now, it'll happen. Think about the firing order. What's the firing order on a 350 Chevy? You should have that memorized. 1, 3, 5, 1, 8, 4, 3, 6, 5, 7, 2. Got me? 1, 8, 4, 3, 6, 5, 7, 2. Which two cylinders on that, which two cylinders on that firing order are next to each other on the engine? Now on a Chevrolet, you're starting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So five and seven are right next to each other on a 350 Chevy. They're also right next to, next to each other in fire order. You'll have the same problem on that one. What you're supposed to do when you've got two plug wires running to the same cylinder side by side, you're supposed to separate those wires and put two other wires between them. And you don't ever have that trouble. You got me? Now you'll also see that sometimes on a Dodge truck, it's got the coil mounted at the front right head, and that coil wire runs all the way back to the distributor, and it's running right next to a whole bunch of other plug wires. It may cause that. And they actually had us go in there and move that coil wire uh, on the opposite side of the valve cover from all of those other wires so we didn't have a problem. I'm telling you that because sometimes you can get, you know, if you don't look at that right to begin with, a guy that's seasoned, and he, you know, you see something, if you just glance at it, you can say, well, if you move those wires, it's cheap and easy to reroute those wires and get them away from one another, isn't it? That don't cost anything. And if it doesn't cost anything and it fixes it, all of a sudden, you know, you're Mr. Fix-It. 
these other guys have already done this, this, and this, and this, and all you did is reroute the plug wire. Explain to me why this fixed this, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, you got to be able, that's why you take speech so you can be able to. Which switching device used below is called a magnetic pulse generator? A, an ignition coil. B, an optical sensor. C, a pickup coil. D, a Hall effect switch. Well, C is actually a pickup coil is going to be a magnetic pulse generator. A Hall effect switch turns the signal off and on in a square wave whenever the, you know, that vein shunts between the magnet and the little uh, semiconductor. Which switching device uses a shutter blade and a sensor to detect a magnetic field? That's the Hall effect switch. Which switching device uses light emitting diodes? That's the optical sensor. Technician A looks for engine speed when cranking an engine that won't start. That's a good thing. Look for engine speed by uh, looking at your scan tool. They're not talking about watching the engine to see if it's moving. They're talking about plugging your scan tool in and looking at the engine RPM. If I go, see, this is what happened with a girl's vehicle out here, the uh, Patrice Owens' vehicle. She, the first time I ever saw her, she came walking in here and said, my trailblazer won't start. So I went, no, 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 no spark. Plug the scan tool in, no, 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 no RPM. So I said, well, crank sensor $16. Brett bought one over her. I could reach it, stuck it in, plug it in. Boom. She'd been coming to us for work ever since. <laughs> Took about 15 minutes and $16 that she was going. Well, that crank sensor, if any, putting out a signal, you know, the scan tool's talking, so you know the PCM's awake. Got me? Okay, if, and if the, if the sensor only costs $16 anyway, let's just throw one in there. It doesn't take me a second. It's easy to do. Now, it's really, really, really hard to get to. That's a little different, but... Still, that's probably going to be, you know. And this is my this is my old rule of thumb that I'm always hitting you with. Uh, the part that's in the most hostile environment that works the hardest is usually the one that's going to fail first. You got me? That's just basically not too hard to figure out. All right. Um, which switching device creates its own electrical voltage pulse? Oh, did I miss 24? Technician A looks for engine speed. Excuse me. Technician B says a problem in the primary circuit can make the tachometer not work. Yeah, that was C, basically. Yeah, the primary circuit is what the tachometer reads off of. Typically, like on my 63 Corvair Spider, the tachometer didn't work because that wire was disconnected from the coil back there. And I thought I had a new car when I finally figured that out and plugged that thing in and saw that tach come alive. Um, let's see. And the switch device that creates its own electrical voltage pulse is a pickup coil. Uh, how many ignition coils should you expect to find on a V6 engine used in a waste spark system? Three. Goodness gracious, everybody. We've got to, do we have a consensus? What's it? It's going to be three. It's going to be half as many as what you yeah. got. On there. Now, Willie, can you put the spark plugs on a 4.6 with your eyes closed now? Yes. Pretty much, can't you? Yes. Yeah. You know, did y'all you all heard about the way that you do that, didn't you? And what did I tell y'all? Two, two long wires. And uh, you got the two long wires, and then you got the two short wires on, the, on this side, and then the next two mediums and the two short wires. Yeah. Sides. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I didn't come up with that. Donnie Hughes came up with that when he was working at Lincoln Mercury. And he was, you know, he was talking one day. He said, the two long ones and the two short ones goes on the uh, passenger side, and the rest of them go on the other side. <laughs> and you can figure out where they go up. If, you know, you don't even need a schematic if, that, if the McCall's still got their numbers on them. You know, so... But it's got them four little, you know, little four popper on each side. All right, uh, let me see here. 27, technician A says a waste spark ignition system fires two plugs at the same time, and he's right about that. Technician B says a waste spark ignition system uses ignition coils connected to companion cylinders, and that's right, too. Companion cylinders meaning the ones that are up at the same time. You got me? And if I've got a five-cylinder, I don't know which ones are the companions on those. You know what I mean? Unless the one in the middle goes up and down by itself. You know, five cylinder. You ever seen a five? Huh? Is it the Audis? Is the Audis is five cylinder, and also Acura Vigor really? is a five cylinder. Yeah, I guess the one in the middle comes up. What's the companion cylinders on a three cylinder? Uh, you know, like a little Geo Metro. Yeah. Both of them on the outside, maybe, and the one in the middle by itself. I don't know. It's crazy odd numbered cylinder cars. Yeah. Okay. Um, Technician A says ignition timing cannot be adjusted on waste spark waste spark systems. Technician B says most waste spark systems use a crankshaft position sensor, and that is number 28, and that is C. Uh, once again, the, the timing can be affected if your little pulse wheel moves because the key is wallered out, so be aware of that. You know, uh, if everything else has already been checked and you're scratching your head, 
I'm going to get a timing light and see if I can figure out, you know, is that thing got retarded timing even though you're not able to adjust it. Now, on some of the, on the Jeeps, they had a crank sensor, and to do altitude modifications on those, if you were going to operate them over 4,000 feet, you got a different crank sensor that would change the timing by having the crank sensor in a different spot. If the crank sensor is indexed different, you know, if it's in a different spot, you're going to have different ignition timing. And if somebody gives you the wrong crank sensor, like if somebody wants a crank sensor for a, like a, 87 to 90 Jeep Cherokee, and you give them the one that's an altitude one, they're going to have pinging and labor knocking and ignition timing that's screwed up. It's got a distributor, but you can't set the timing. Got me? Uh, on that one, if you turn it, all you'll do is a, it screw up the rotor alignment. It's going to buck and jump going down the road. Let me tell you about that for just a brief second. If you're driving down the road on one that does not have an adjustable timing, but the distributor can turn, and you're feeling it like when you're up there in a float, floating, I'm talking about 50 miles an hour, holding your speed, and you feel it bumping and jumping then, but it runs fairly normal every other time, I'm going to go and find out about rotor alignment. Now, on your Chevrolet, you're supposed to do your camera retard offset adjustment on that with your scan tool. On your Jeep, you're basically are going to cut a window in an old distributor cap and put it on there so that it, when number one's on top dead center, the rotor's just passing that firing post, and that way they'll put the firing window in the dead center in on that post lock it down there. You're not setting time and you're just changing rotor alignment when you turn the distributor on that kind of vehicle. And that can cause you to, you know, button jump like that. I would really like to be able to just pour everything I know into your head so you'd be able to just go out there and figure like things out. Too. There's a lot that I don't know, but there's a lot that I do know. And I've got some experience. But at the same time, nobody knows everything. And no matter how smart somebody is, they're going to wind up not being able to figure something out right away sometimes. You know what I mean? It's always, the ones you figure out the quickest are the ones that teach you the least. You know what I'm saying? If you get smacked around on by one, you're going to learn what you learned on that one. Me and Daniel yesterday, we were noticing that when we put that nice new fuel pump on that Bronco, you'll be interested in this. That pressure, you remember you were seeing eight yeah. pounds of pressure? That fuel pump that we jerked out of the box and popped on there, it brought it up to 30 pounds, which was better. We still didn't have nothing, no starting going on. And I says, let me go ahead and have you, we're going to drop that thing in a bucket of gas and let it just suck right out of the gas and see if it'll do better. But first I need to take the fuel pressure gauge off. It was sitting there with 30 pounds of pressure showing on a gauge. This is funny. You probably didn't know about this. I'm going to take a fuel pressure gauge off to see, because after Kelly then worked his fanny off on a bunch of stuff. And so it'll wet you when you're doing, I didn't want, you know, releasing the pressure, you know, like yeah. smart. And so when I released the pressure, it went, Psh so we put gas in it and it started up. No way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the gauge was lying, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, well what, yeah, I don't know what happened. Maybe somebody siphoned it out. But when me and Daniel got through, <laughs> it, it actually, it had something. But, uh, that was funny. Whenever you're checking for for gas, and it may, but what got me was, you know, I told him, I said, there was a technical service bulletin for it. It says, air and or water may pressurize. It looked like you said, fuel delivery. And that thing, I wonder why that pressure was coming up so slow. That pump was pushing air. And it gave me 30 pounds of air pressure, which was interesting. <laughs> Brilliant. You see pressure, it doesn't mean you got fuel there. That's the point. All right. So, uh, 29. 29. All these terms have been used to describe communication between the ignition module and PCM, except. ESD. What do you think, y'all? What about DIS? SPOUT is Ford's acronym for spark output. On the Bronco, if you look down there by the ignition module, you'll see a little jumper plug that's got two yellow wires going to it. And that's the wire that the computer uses to modify the ignition timing on that thick film ignition system. EST is your GM thing. Um, heck, I don't know what IC is, but obviously it's been used because DIS is the only thing that's not used to describe communication between the ignition module and PCM. Incidentally, on this one right here, on the old uh, TFI, the PCM would tell the TFI module, you will fire the ignition coil at this particular, you know, whatever, this ignition timing angle. And the, uh, the little uh, DIS module had no um, compunction except it had to do this, right? This particular one, this EDIS, they would send a message over here. The PCM sends a message to this one, and they call it SAW which stands for spark angle word. And the ignition, uh, the DIS module says, 
I will give you this ignition timing setting if I decide I want to. It's basically a request. This is a sort of a smart box here, you know. All right. So as a, the way they do this is slightly different. Um, all right. Number th number 30, Technician A says in bypass mode, the ignition system is timed by the ignition module. Technician B says that in bypass mode, the ignition system does not use the PCM to time spark plug firing. And number 30 is C. Uh, here's another thing. If I happen to have you set in the ignition timing on the Bronco or a reasonable facsimile of it, it's got fake film ignition. And let's, you know how you pull that little elbow shaped spark, I mean, terminal off the uh, solenoid on the fender and start it with your screwdriver? You know what I mean? If you do that and you set the timing, even when you pull the spout connector to set the timing, and everybody needs to know how to do that, when you pull the spout connector and you set the timing that way, uh, don't be surprised if it's wrong. The reason for that is when you turn the key to the start position, it basically fires up a circuit in that. There's a start wire going to that module. fires up a circuit in that module, and it's using a different part of the module for start than it is run. And it'll get confused, and it will be operating the ignition system on a different mode than it's supposed to when you are setting your timing. I actually set it on 10 degrees, and I knew it was right. And then when I plugged it back in, the next time the guy started it, it was at 15 degrees because of the, you know, the, I didn't actually feed, when I jumped it out here at the solenoid, I didn't actually feed that start circuit, and that just blew me away because I didn't know that, you know, I found out about that the hard way, and then I read it somewhere, it's more to do it. Okay, um, let me see. The following statements are all correct except what? Waste spark systems do not need a timing signal from the PCM when cranking the engine. Up integrated ignition controls use the PCM to control ignition timing. No ignition system uses the PCM to control ignition timing. Waste spark ignition systems use a signal from the PCM once the engine is running. That's Charlie. How does how does a vehicle act if I've adjusted the ignition timing and it's too fast, it's too advanced? How does the engine sound when it's starting on one that ignition timing has been pulled around too far? Got any idea? No, it kicks back. You know, you ever heard that? And it'll spin, and then what it's doing is firing while it's coming up. Whomp. And all that. So if the timing is too fast, it can do that. Usually if you've got temp ignition timing that's too fast, it'll make it labor knock, and it'll make it start hard. Now, in some cases, it'll just make it run crazy going down the road, but that's almost never does it ever do that. So always remember that if you hear one kicking back, and you know the spark plug wires on it right, I need to check the ignition time, and if it has a distributor, make sure it's not advanced too much. Got me? You understand that? Now, here's another thing. One day, out there, at the Ford place, this, uh, whenever you switch on the key, a DuraSpark ignition, like that big gray module over on the board, will pop the coil one time when you switch on the key. Pop. And I've seen these V6, I mean these straight six Fords, you know, like the old older trucks. You turn the key on, it will fire that call when you switch on the key before you even hit the starter. It'll fire that call, and that spark will happen to be going to the right cylinder, and there'll be a little gas left in there from the last time you switched it off. And as soon as you turn on the key, it'll fire up without ever touching the starter. Boom! And the engine's running. And all I do is just turn on the key. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, it's, it'll spook you because you wonder what in the Sam Hill's going on. I got a gremlin here or something, you know? But, uh, but, I mean, that's just basically, somebody was talking about them doing that so you could have a vehicle without a starter, you know. Waste spark ignitions being discussed. Technician A says more voltage is required to fire the compression cylinder than the companion cylinder. Technician B says waste spark systems use compression sensing electronics do not require a camshaft sensor for engine position. That is Charlie. What statement below is correct? Ignition control circuits cannot sense the voltage required to fire a spark plug. All coil on plug systems require ignition wires. It's not possible to control the ignition timing for each cylinder separately, where coil on plug systems use one ignition coil per cylinder. And that is correct. All following statements are correct, except, and this is an ASE style question, ignition timing may either be ATDC, TDC, or BTDC. Knock sensors require voltage input from the PCM to function properly. When replacing a spark plug, consider reach, heat range, and seat type. When the PCM detects detonation using the knock sensor, it will regard retard ignition timing. Actually, knock sensors require uh, voltage input. 
from the piece. That's the wrong. That's wrong. And they don't because what is in a knock sensor? A knock sensor has got a piece of quartz in it, and the pressure that's exerted on that piece of quartz by the engine knock is going to cause it to generate voltage, and that's going to go on there. So what's the frequency of an engine knock? One of the people that I went to school under at uh, when I was went up there at Jeep School in Atlanta said that the frequency of an engine knock is 5,555 hertz. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he said. And it's not hard to remember because it's all fives. Got me? All right, anybody got any comments about that? I have lots of war stories if you just want to talk about. Uh -huh. We'll see you later.